Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome folks online, looking over at the OWL and everyone who is here on campus. This is day one of our Black Church Studies consultation. It has been a full day already, lots of folks on campus. I especially appreciate the wellness fair that we had in the Wind Center. Thank you everybody who uh, showed up and participated, but especially all of those wellness providers who are here to give us the opportunity to take a breath, to connect, and to be thankful. We began our uh, BCS consultation today with worship in the chapel at noon, and we are leading through a very full day today. I'm excited that our, uh, our speaker today, Dr. Barr, will be offering the Edwards Lecture. Professor Justin Reed will offer an introduction, but I'd like to begin with prayer here first. Amen. Welcome everyone, thank you all for being a part of us. Let us pray. Gracious Almighty God, we are quite thankful, not just for the opportunity to learn together, to be challenged, to hear your word interpreted, proclaimed, and alive in the world, but truly that we have the opportunity to do it that way, together. Bless the work that we do here at Louisville Seminary that extends beyond our borders. Help us to be thankful that not only does the Black Church Studies program benefit our students who are here, but our connections and our partnerships with so many within the church world that we continue to learn from and with. Let that continue to be a blessing and help us be very thankful that we were able to have these partnerships and we're able to listen carefully as we seek justice and peace in our world here and all around us. By your son's name, we ask your blessing on Dr. Barr's talk and the continuation of the consultation this evening. Amen. 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 And I am delighted to bring forward Professor Justin Reed. Justin, lecture today, and so I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Barr. I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. Dr. Reverend Dr. Tony Barr brings a wealth of experience and expertise to his role as a minister, executive leader, and community advocate. With over 25 years of dedicated ministry leadership, he has served congregations with passion, compassion, and a commitment to spiritual growth and social justice. Dr. Barr's corporate background spans 21 years, where he honed his skills in business and information systems, leveraging his strategic acumen to drive organizational success. His impact extends beyond the pulpit, as evidenced by his remarkable track record of securing over $2.5 million in grants for churches and nonprofits between 2000 and 2023. Dr. Barr holds a degree in business information systems from Winston-Salem State University, complemented by a Master of Divinity degree from Apex School of Theology and a Doctorate of Ministry degree from Virginia Union University. A native of High Point, North Carolina, Dr. Barr is deeply rooted in his community where he's lived and served for decades. He shares a fulfilling partnership with his wife of 35 years, Sharon Barr, and takes pride in their two children. As the president and CEO of Building Up Incorporated, Dr. Barr leads an organization dedicated to strengthening the foundations of churches and nonprofits. Building Up Incorporated offers a comprehensive range of services, including to make a profound impact on communities empowering organizations to thrive and fulfill their missions with purpose and excellence. Uh, his life mantra is building a church that Christ is looking for, one person at a time. I've had the privilege of having a few conversations with Dr. Barr, and I can uh, speak to the fact that things that are mentioned in this bio about him being compassionate, about him having a heart for social justice, um, about him being thoughtful, is uh, the type of person that he is, and it's what you're going to get to experience as he talks about the future of the black church, including what's challenging and what's promising. So can we all give a warm welcome to Dr. Barr. This is, this is one more thing for people who are online, just for you, special note. Um, as you listen, you can ask your question for everyone to hear. Thank you. Well, good evening, afternoon, whatever your preference is. It is good to see smiling faces, and I'm assuming those online are smiling or <laughs> drinking coffee or whatever you might be doing. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to be here with you and to be in the wonderful state of Kentucky and the wonderful metropolis of Louisville. Uh, I have been indoctrinated to the proper way to say it. Uh, now, when I go back to North Carolina, that may change, but at least for today, it is well. 
Uh, I am so grateful for the few moments I've been able to spend in person. Uh, Dr. Reed and I have been communicating so much, uh, you know, in the non-scene space. We really, kind of are just grateful and thankful for him. And to Sandra, thank you so much for uh, making my transition here wonderful as well, except for what you told me right before I stood up here. Uh, I'm one of those people that if you tell me don't, that's what I'm drawn towards. She, she, she kind of hit me with the folder guy. She said, don't look into the light. But thank God for the light of Jesus Christ that I'm asking to, to stand here before you to, today. Um, so as I come to share with you today, uh, most recently I served as the Executive Secretary Treasurer with the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina, uh, which is comprised of about 1,600 uh, churches across the state of North Carolina um, in every type of context you could consider. And so one of the beautiful things that came out of COVID that I've seen firsthand uh, is that first and foremost of compassion. Uh, I think the church had gotten so comfortable and gone on autopilot that we kind of lost some of our compassion. And I think we gained a good portion of that back uh, through the time and season of COVID. And the second thing I saw is capacity. Uh, despite all the things we don't have and the things we want that we don't haven't acquired yet, uh, we have a tremendous capacity to do some tremendous, tremendous works to our communities on behalf of the God that we serve. And so I'm able to stand here today uh, with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, I can tell you that through the last three and a half years, I, uh, on occasion, have used some non-Sunday school words. <laughs> uh, but it has been a time of education that I don't think a classroom could ever teach me. And so from and through that experience in my life ministry experience, I want to be able to share uh, with you today. And to President Palmerville, thank you so much for coming in and making me feel welcomed as I already had such uh, a great welcome by the rest of your staff and by our uh, noonday kickoff. I was so mm -hmm. blessed and challenged by that word and those of you who were there and are watching, I know that uh, there are some challenges happening in your heart uh, to see whether or not we can answer that call. So in thinking about uh, the future of the black church, I wanted to kind of first kind of start with defining what that is and what that means how a lot of the times in the church especially in the african-american church that it is truly the largest oil tanker you've ever seen on the on the water in that a speedboat turned instantaneously down ship but uh but it's it's one of those things that i believe is returning the church back to the, the place where god would have us to be so as a, as a good preacher and pastor should do let me start out uh, with some scripture and looking at Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 16 through 23 is what should appear on your screen. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So it reads, but Jesus said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and invited many guests. And at the dinner hour, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come because everything is ready now. Make sure I'm following. Okay, let's see which way it's flowing now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have purchased a piece of land and I have to go out and see it. Please consider me excused. Another said, I have purchased five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Verse 20, and another said, I have recently married a wife and for that reason I am unable to come. So the servant came back and reported to his master. Then the master, the head of the household, became angry at the rejection of his invitation and said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the land, to the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the disabled and the blind and the lame. Verse 22, and the servant after returning said, sir, what you, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. Then the master told the servant, go out and into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come so that my house may be filled with guests. So a uh, passage of scripture I think most of us are very familiar with. That was from the Amplified. And looking at 
the unique position of the church and how we are not only poised for success, but primed for success. Um, if you have any broken, wounded, lame, hurting people in your community, guess what? That is our target audience. <laughs> and if we're going to be really the effective church that God is looking for, we can't be looking for perfect people. We have to look for broken people. We can't look for people who are already in a place in life where they don't need direction from God, but we need people who are misdirected, out of place, people who maybe are uncouth uh, to understand that this is what ministry is. Ministry is dirty, and real ministry always meets people right where they are. So this unique place that the church holds, that we're right here in the context where there are needy people all around us. And I like, so this fear that right now the church is saying, where are the people? The people are where they're supposed to be. And if there's somebody out of place, I would say we might need to look at ourselves. I think we're the ones that may just be out of place, but we're still in position because we're right where God would have for us to be. So we have this unique position. We have this unique placement. The church is, church is uniquely positioned right where people live and do life. So our engagement with them for us is a bit of a paradigm shift because we lived by the old Kevin Costner view that if you build it, they will come. So let me give you the Tony Barr translation. You can build it, but they ain't coming. That's a North Carolina translation. So, so now we've got to begin to look at uh, ways where we can begin to reshape how we do ministry and how we do church, and in particularly how the black church does church and engages with uh, with the community. So let's let's look and start talking and discussing about a definition of when we say the black church. What does that really mean? And I'm drawing this definition from C. Eric Lincoln's work, the black church in the African American experience. And his, his work and this definition that we're going to walk through real quickly here is based on the seven predominant African-American denominations, those being AME, AMEZ, CME, NBC, uh, USA, which stands for National Baptist USA, NBCA, PNBC, and Cogent. And so this definition, this working definition of this work that is a, a, a pretty old work, but really, really still good, uh, when we try to identify what it means to be a black church, it means that it is predominantly led by African-American leadership or by black leaders. Predominantly, the attendees are themselves black. The document that reflects the historic black Christianity, Christian orthodoxy, uh, which is more liberated uh, in tone, even though in practice it may not be. Um, and it's going to have that visible influence, again, of that, that, that core seven. I'll refer to it that way. I met some wonderful sisters earlier who uh, pastor, uh, I think one in AME, AME church and the other CME, if my memory serves. Uh, but but that's that's where he's drawing this book <coughs> from that he did. So he's saying for it, for it to be a, a black church, as we might say, it'll have some of these identifying markers and then it ought to have a visible influence, a visible influence taking in and encompassing those seven denominations, but and the way we do church and what we call the black church experience, uh, it's different. It has its own style. If, if I can shape it this way, it's Louisiana. It's got its own gumbo. And, and you may mix it a couple of different ways. Instead of using shrimp, you may use something else. But it's all gumbo, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this, this experience that you have, that even if the marquee doesn't say it, you know that the black experience, because it's got these identifying markers, uh, it encompasses this work that we would call the black church. So starting with that is, is kind of saying this is the context that we're talking about whenever we say or we're referring to uh, the black church. So contributions of the black church. What, what has the black church done historically? How has it been a place of change? How has it been a place of impact? Uh, what things has the black church done that has given us the significance that we still see here in our everyday life? That, there is a social and community uh, impact that this is the place where black people had their relevance. This was the place that allowed black people to be in leadership. This was the place that gave black people a platform where they could now not only communicate, but be seen in the, um, and I'm gonna show you this in a slide later, 
that there is this God gene in black people to where it almost seems like faith is a part of blackness. Now, I know that may be offensive to some, but it almost seems as though it's, it's, it's somehow in the DNA of black people to, to have faith or to believe in God. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean to say that if you don't, that, that you, you, you're not really black, but um, for us to understand this. And so there is this mysticism around the black church and around God that uh, is a part of the black church experience, uh, as we said earlier. This thing of advocacy and civil rights, that the church was this place that was this significant fulcrum that God used to transform the United States and help even pull the world into a different place in, a, in respect to slavery and how people were being treated. But the church and the work that was done uh, during the time of civil rights uh, is a job that, uh, if I can say it this way without offending, I think it's part of the problem we're having now. Mm -hmm. It being so successful that we put the car on cruise control mm -hmm. and we just let it keep on coasting mm -hmm. and keep on going. And now that we have reaped the rich rewards of civil rights, part of what has been a blessing is now somewhat working against us. Uh, also, this cultural pre preservation that that the identity of blackness and black people, mm -hmm. that being the place where it is centrally welcomed and it is fostered and it is grown and it has a significance. And the black church has also been very impactful in political mobilization. Uh, souls to the polls, uh, which, which was in North Carolina was a big initiative and it's still a big initiative now. And even though it's dwindling down to a certain degree to where we knew that if we had people who couldn't get transportation, that had obstacles in their way, we load people up in church vans and station wagons and help stand with you so you don't have to be fearful of poll taxes or anything else that people may throw at you to prohibit you from being able to vote, but being a great motivator uh, to where we are able to bring people in the masses um, to the place where they can exercise their right as citizens of this nation. But, but those are some of the works that uh, the African American church has done that's given it this significance uh, and, and, and why we are talking about it today. So, so going to the next slide, I want to share some statistical data with you that speaks to the fact that, uh, and this study was done by Pew in 2019, of uh, how African Americans are, are, based upon this study, more religious um, than, than the overall public, which, which I found this, some of this to be quite interesting. So, Believing in God, believing in a higher, higher power, 90% of all adults agreed with that, that, that took place in the survey, participating in the survey. But 97% of African Americans who were polled believed in God or believed in the higher power. Uh, belief that evil spirits can harm you, still connecting that spirituality, connecting that to God. Most, uh, the remainder of the public, 54%, and this is a 73% of African Americans that were surveyed. You evil spirits can harm you. Religion is very important to them. Forty percent overall to all other groups. Fifty-nine percent to African American. Uh, I found this part interesting, and it's most interesting because sometimes I spent in Haiti. Prayers to ancestors can protect from harm. Uh, and so, if you really spend time in Haiti and you really spend time around those who who practice voodoo, it's not what we've seen on TV. Right. It really is a prayer to the ancestors. And, and believing that they're there and they're with us, which is really kind of a connection even to the New Testament. Paul says that we have, not Paul, it's written that we have this great cloud of witness, right? That, that this, this embodiment that's unseen of people, of believers who have gone before us, that, that they're there and they're always with us. But African Americans believe in 33% that prayers to their ancestors. So based upon this research that African Americans are, are a little more inclined to have a faith or belief in God, a belief in God. So this is a part of this culture and a part of this building. So, so let's look at now some current societal problems that are facing the black church. What are some of the issues that the black church is facing or even our black context? Uh, police brutality. We, we've seen uh, things, especially over the last uh, three years, that aren't new, uh, police brutality and uh, over-policing, 
is not new. Abuse of authority isn't new. Law enforcement breaking the law that they uphold, not, not all law enforcement is evil. That's, that's not the point of getting at. But, but it's not new. But that is something that is being faced uh, by the African American church because it's still viewed as a place you come when you have a problem. Wealth disparities, especially to those historically marginalized populations, we're looking at how now there is still this place to where uh, wealth is skewed and there are some systemic things in place that stop or prohibit uh, equal access to, to wealth or those things that might grow wealth and things that are even counterproductive to wealth, uh, looking at maybe even food as well. That in your community, if you have plenty of grocery stores, you eat good, healthy food, good for your brain, good for your body, versus if you live in a neighborhood that, that maybe is a food desert, that you don't have fresh food. And the best you can do is a family dollar-like store that carries a lot of stuff, that's got a lot of preservatives and carbohydrates. Will it fill your belly? Yeah. Is it gonna make you the best you you can be? No, it's not. And so those types of things, when I say are prohibitive um, uh, and add to wealth disparities. Uh, substandard housing and people living in conditions that are, that, are, that are less than what we might even have in some of our dog houses. When we have people that are living in places with no running water and no electricity and the law allows it, they're paying rent to someone and they're living in substandard housing and even limitation of access to fair housing. Uh, underfunded and under-resourced schools, that is still a reality and I know that is a hot button when we start talking about education, uh, but underfunding to where you have one school group or one school district that has the newest books, they got Apple computers, and we got some people that have Macintosh. Some of y'all aren't old enough <laughs> to know Macintosh from Apple. It's yeah. same, but if you're talking about a Macintosh computer, you have something antiquated. It's not even old. It's outdated. And so, so we have people who are using older books or no books whatsoever, and so under, underfunded schools. Uh, a biased judicial system. I uh, was having a dialogue with a friend, and he said, the lady justice is blind. I said, yeah, but the people who direct her hands can see very well. Um, to where we see a, a judicial system that doesn't always act uh, fair and balanced uh, to uh, those who are African American. Gentrification is real. Uh, it goes by several different names. It's called economic development. Uh, but it is the taking away from those who don't have or allowance to communities and neighborhoods to be decreased to the point to where the property values go to nil, people who are wealthy come in buy those, rehabilitate it, and then make it a place just like the wonderful hotel that uh, Director Reed put me up in the gym. <laughs> Um, I, I love it. I walked in there and I was like, am I supposed to be here? Um, but, but that area, I was at breakfast this morning and the lady was telling me the lay of the land and what we could do and what things were there around us. And she said, I'm not supposed to say this, but this is a gentrified area. And I, I, I just appreciated her, her honesty. She didn't have to share that. But gentrification, uh, political toxicity um, to the nth degree. Uh, and things that are happening that are dividing us as a people um, to the point to where just because you have a different political view than I do, now we can't even talk, even if we're family, even if we go to church. Uh, and the abuse uh, of the political system that uh, those who are of the faith community and, and 501c3, there's certain things we shouldn't say, and we see certain groups that say whatever they want to say. Uh, a Bible college that I graduated from Literally, the president of the university literally looked us in the face and said, if you don't vote in this group, you're not saved. Uh, and, and those types of things that are totally against, against, again, against the law, but those types of things are, are happening. happening. Uh, the last thing that the African American community is facing, but our country is facing overall, is probably one of the most dangerous, toxic things uh, in the last hundred years, and that is Christian nationalism. Um, where you have mixing of ideology and faith. Uh, and I've always been one that I think our faith should feed our ideology, that our ideology shouldn't feed our faith. 
uh, because now you get into a mode where you can uh, manipulate people's faith. And so those are some of the things that the church is facing, some of the things the African American church is facing. Uh, a few more things, and I'm just kind of building the case, and then we're going to look at some uh, plausible solutions to help uh, the black church and to help the church overall because we know we are one body in Christ. Okay, let's look at uh, what I call community retrogression. Let's look at some ways uh, that our communities are actually kind of backing up uh, in time. Redlining. Redlining is still real. We still have restrictive lending. We still have some uh, very odd things that happen as relate to who can get a mortgage and who can't get a mortgage, what their rates are, whitewashing. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that term whitewashing, but whitewashing as it relates to property ownership is I own a house uh, and I own a house in a certain neighborhood and I'm going to sell the house and it comes in and it's appraised for $100,000. But I know that the value of the house based upon the time I've owned it is $200,000. So whitewashing is when I go in and I take down everything that would reflect that there's an African American family there mm -hmm. and I get a Caucasian friend to come in and stand in my place oh, yeah. and whitewash my home. And there have been several instances over the last several years Probably the highest one a lot of us saw was in California where you had an African-American couple that had a home, and I think the value of the home, it was valued at like $900,000, which, you know, Dr. Reed can live in the house like that. We can't live in the house. <laughs> so most of us would have been happy with a million dollar property, right? But they knew that it had a higher value than that. So what this African-American family did was got some good colleagues, good friends who came in, they took down all of their pictures, took down all of their African-American art and, and replaced it with a more traditional art. I'll say it that way. And Caucasian family came in, same property, came in valued at 1.5 million. Wow. Within three months, I don't want you to think a bunch of work was done or community had changed or transformed, but whitewashing is when you have to erase the fact that there's a black presence there and it impacts the value. And I know for some of us in this room, we're like, that doesn't happen, but it, it does. Um, so, so these are things prison. And marijuana is still terrible, but cannabis is okay. <laughs> right? You can, you can, I don't want to get political, you, you can be totally against the use of marijuana, but then as a senator, you can sit on the board of a cannabis company. Yeah. And, and those, those two don't jive. So it criminalizes certain behaviors that you're trying to downplay to help you kind of maintain control. Undereducating, miseducating, um, but work, great work by uh, Carp G. Woodson many, many years ago. And it's so prevalent right now. We see things that are happening. And I'm not saying everybody has to believe what you believe. But if you have to rob every option that doesn't agree with your point of view, are you really educating or you're indoctrinating? Yeah. And that word indoctrination is being thrown around, and I respect everyone's point of view, but if you have to minimize the resources that are available for me to read and grow, you're not really educating, you're miseducating. Yeah. Recidivism. Oh gosh, this is a terrible problem. So I go to prison. I did something wrong. I pay my price to society. I come back out, and because I have a, an F beside my name for a felony, now I can't get a job. But I've got to pay restitution. I've got to take care of my kids. I've got to do what I can to have a roof over my head, but I can't get a job. So since I can't do it, recidivism says you go in, you come out, you can't do it, so you go back in. Not because you're lazy, but because you're not given an opportunity. When you have organizations who have federal funding given to them to help give second chances, but they won't give it out. So recidivism is something that's impacting us. Perpetual reliance on social security or the social safety net. Never forget, I was pastoring the church in Central Approved for Section 8 housing, I'm gonna get my own apartment. And in one regard, I would be happy too, but you're, you're 17. You haven't finished your education. You haven't finished maturing. You're not ready for your own apartment, but you would have thought that she was moving into a million dollar home and her family lived under the social safety net 
and had learned to live life down here instead of striving to be the best they can be. So, so there are a lot of these things that are in place, and I won't dig into them all, but just trying to give reference to, these are some of the, the societal and systemic things that, that African American communities are facing, and subsequently so is the African American church. So economic equality, let me, let me move us to another slide. Let me show you uh, some information here about economic inequality. So you can see your rule down here, what each of the lines represent. And those are making reference to uh, the lines that are on the left side. So if we look at the white non-Hispanic, that is the blue line that is up top, that is doing fairly well. You can see the time period from 1989 to 2019 when the study was done. And you see, for the most part, a growth upwards. Uh, and you can see the salary range of, of our um, European brothers and sisters. But when we look at that second line before it, those are the other, those are the non-Hispanic, those may be our Asian brothers and sisters and others, they're doing very well. Um, I mean, in looking at that salary range from 400,000 up, um, they're doing very, very well. But when we look at the bottom of this and we start talking about economic equality and having access to grow at the same pace, when you see the green line, the second from the bottom here, uh, that represents our Hispanic and Latino Latinx community, uh, which, which is coming up, which is coming up. And the bottom line is one of the groups that's been here the longest, that represents the Black or African American. And has never reached a point anywhere close to our Caucasian sisters and brothers. If I can steal a phrase from a very old, very bad movie called Head of State with Chris Rock. He had a, a hook that he had in that movie when he was running for president. He would say, that ain't right. Um, that ain't right. Right. So, so looking at this, this wealth inequality, I've got I've to move on. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm still trying to build the case here. So let's go to, to the next slide. We'll look real quickly at some internal challenges. So we look at a lot of things that are facing the African American church that are without. Now let's look at those things that are within. We have a maturing congregation. Uh, most of our congregations are more mature. They're, they're older. Um, leadership challenges, a lack of succession planning that, uh, you know, this is a leadership principle I teach. If you lead something for more than 10 years, it's going to die. Yeah. Um, because everybody behind you, especially in the church, is going to be afraid to change anything because Brother Barr did it like this for 10 years. We can't change it. It's a sacred child. And we don't have any plan of leadership. I was talking to, to Dr. Reed about a church I'm helping through a pastoral search process right now. They just buried their pastor. Pastor Judy, he was 94 years old. Yeah. Wow. The Sundays he could come to church, they literally had to help him in the pulpit and literally had to have somebody stand there and hold him. Wow. We don't have any plan for secession and we don't plan for retirement and we are, we're doing foolish things that we call trusting God. And we're not doing a retirement. <laughs> we're not putting money away and we call that trusting God. And then we get so old to where we should divide, but we know our generational divides right now are a little more deep and a little more severe. Uh, to where you have groups calling out, you know, you got this thing between the millennials and the boomers, and I mean, if you watch social media, it gets pretty ugly. But generational divide, membership decline. Um, you know, if if you're just maintaining what you got, you're losing because attrition is going to take you out. Cultural relevance. A lot of people feel like the church, especially the black church, has just lost their their north star, and they're no longer culturally relevant. Um, to where they're just seen as a church. Maybe not even called the black church because in essence they kind of lost their relevance where the church used to stand up for everybody. And that seems like the church is only standing up for certain people. Um, this, is, this might hurt a little bit. Any effect of denominational structures. So in where I was leading uh, with the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. So 1,600 churches, states broken up into these associations. Associations basically are a small snapshot of what the state is doing, what the state is teaching, the standard bearer. Uh, well, now, at a time where associations were so relevant, because we didn't have mass transportation. You know, everybody didn't have multiple cars they could drive, and so people had limited access to transportation. You're not helping me grow. You're not helping my church to expand. You're not challenging my outlook. You're just doing the same thing. 
And if the local association is doing it, they're doing it because the state is doing it. Mm -hmm. Whatever your hierarchy is, but it's very frustrating when you can see change needs to happen, but because of your denominational structure, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that might be a painful conversation for some of us, but either we're going to look to change those things, or we're going to die. Yeah. Right? Uh, discipleship app. This is one that breaks my heart. I did a one-year discipleship lesson, and it required the people to do homework. They had to read every day. They had to write things down. And I had a Bible study. Uh, it was a community Bible study. We'd have a couple hundred people in there. My Bible study went down to about 50 people because mm -hmm. they didn't want to commit to mm -hmm. I mean, we were supposed to study to show ourselves approved, right? And I realized real life happens. Everybody gets busy. But, but there seems to be this apathy towards discipleship and committing oneself to the Lord and doing those basic things that allow us to do what we call the body of Christ. So these are some of the internal challenges that are facing uh, the black church, but I think all churches declining attendance, especially after COVID. Uh, people aren't coming to church like they used to. And, and what the research is saying right now is a third will not be back. And I'm going to talk about a solution that uh, when we get, get to the end, but we see this reduction. But don't just complain about people not coming to church, but ask yourself why. Because it's easy to get mad at them, but I would tell you to kind of do like the discipleship, the disciples and say, Lord, is it I? Yeah. What are you offering? Right. Remember, we live in this time of, of room when Moses went before Pharaoh and you throw down your rod. I got a rod too. Mm -hmm. The world has everything the church has. And if you don't do something that shows yourself to be different, then you're going to continue to see this decline. And if you got to convert yourself to be more like the world, as we were saying earlier today, I'll tell you this. If you do something fleshy to get them, you have to do fleshy things to keep them. Okay? We had a crazy thing going on in social media on um, New Year's. A church did some things, and they had a, this one particular church had 150 people supposedly come to Christ. And they did that by playing a no rhythm. <laughs> uh, but, but there is this rhythm that everybody has in life. And so you'll respond to something like that, but that doesn't mean it's, it's Christ. So, so we want to be careful how we're doing things. So the, this decline in attendance, um, generational shifts in the way we see things. I grew up in the time and in the era to where embeddedness, our embeddedness, our nature, our place to where we are both independent and interdependent on one another. And this thing you've heard me talk about, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, and our working together, that what's going to pull us out is our embeddedness, that we're in the places where I began where people both live and function and do life, and there is this interdependence that humanity has on one another. Look at how God made everything. Uh, if we look at the uh, revelatory record in Genesis 1, Everything was connected to the next thing that was made thereafter. And we as people, we as humanity, we all have this interconnectedness uh, that God uses to bring forth his will. So we have this common bond, this common connection uh, that we have that I believe God wants to use to bring us out. So what are some things that the black church can do now to begin to reconnect with the community? What are some ways the church can begin to rebuild itself uh, in, a, in a way to where we still uphold the truth of scripture, but we're able to connect deeper and better with the community at large. What are some things churches can begin to implement to kind of get us back to the root for? Remember Jesus, as he was quoting, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to the halt, to the lame, to the blind, to all of these different demographics of people. So how do we get back to that place to where we're connected with them instead of waiting for them to connect with us? Mm -hmm. We've been on cruise control. This is the way uh, Poe said it uh, in his book, um, uh, uh, New, New Wine, New Wine Skins. Uh, he talked about the, the dichotomy between being angry at people who won't come to church and not want them to come to church because they won't act like us. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. God knows I don't want anybody to act like me. So, so what are some things that the church can do right now to be able to start to connect and reconnect with our communities and build a vibrant, vibrant 
uh, community of believers and to empower our communities to live better. What are some things that the church can do? So there are several things here on this slide. Everything I'm about to say is not on this slide, but there are a lot of things that we can do to begin to immediately connect and reconnect. So how about having recovery meetings at your church? One of the biggest things we have that the community needs are facilities. Yep. Yes. How about hosting recovery, not you, but there are agencies and organizations out there. The way we're going to really move forward is through partnership, this embeddedness, and partnering with other organizations to where the church is not out front, and it's not your name. And you may not get credit for it, but it's going to impact people. It's what we call side door evangelism. It's when we reach people at the point of their need. That's where real ministry is. Real ministry already meets, always meets people at the point of their needs. So having those type of recovery meetings, that recovery support group, to where you find organizations in your community that need a place to host their meetings, you just make sure it's open, that the air or the heat is on, they have access to everything that they need, doesn't require you to be a professional in substance abuse. Now, I know some of you are probably well-versed in substances. <laughs> I, I know because I looked at some of y'all's fingertips when you came in. It's another conversation. Some of y'all aren't ready for that conversation. Um, but, but no, we're not the subject matter experts. And we're not going to try to be. But we're going to use our facility. But guess what? When people's lives are impacted, when their lives are changed, when their lives are made better, they're going to remember where it happened. That's right. So it's not about you getting the credit for it, it's about having an impact, why? Because you are embedded, you connect with your community. Transitional housing. So many of our churches have pastoral residents that are vacant because most pastors do not want to live in a parsonage. Why? Because of you. Because <laughs> they're glad to tell them. Because they know that you won't respect their time. They're, you're going to come and knock on the door. They don't get to be married. They don't get to take care of their kids. They don't have any. So our parsonages are vacant. Well, instead of letting it sit there, how about we make it into transitional housing either one or two ways? Maybe for those who are coming to this country that are trying to reestablish themselves. There are with organizations that are already doing this work, and you're going to use something that's sitting there collecting dust. And maybe if not for those who are reestablishing their life, what about using it as a place of mentoring for home ownership? Amen. To where you take members of your church, you take them through this class, and at the end of the year, they graduate by buying their own house. It's sitting there right now collecting dust. Why not look at using that as a place where we can use it for home mentorship? Now, everybody in this room, in case you don't know it, there will be a day where you're no longer here. Right? We're all going to leave this earthly tabernacle, right? Yeah. Why not have some pre-burial classes? Yeah. Why not open it up to the whole community yeah. and bring in funeral directors and, and insurance companies? They would love yeah. to talk to a room full of people. I know we don't, morbidity, we don't like to talk about life and death, but we know it's all part of life. Yeah. But bringing the community in and not just making it the church club. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I say we get on each other's nerves so badly is because we're only working with ourselves. Yeah. And so we frustrate each other. But, but knowing to where we can open it up to the community and bring people in and talk about these pre-burial needs to where when somebody dies, we're not having to do a GoFundMe. We're not having people make critical life decisions in a broken moment. Yeah. Um, when I came in last night, and I'm 90 years old, uh, just transitioned with the Lord yesterday. Mm -hmm. And her children told hospice, we appreciate it, but we're going to take care of our mama. And they have <laughs> taken care of her, even to the degree last night before they called the coroner and all people come in, they rebathed her, yeah. redressed her, dignified her, brought her in. My family is hurting. They don't need to worry about buying a casket. Yeah. You don't make good decisions while your heart's broken. You make those decisions while you're in your right mind, or some semblance of a right mind. But we have these workshops where we teach the community the value of 
pre-planning your funeral so families don't fall out because you want the old reverend to do the service and they want the new reverend to do the service and now you stop speaking and you laugh but it's real and families fall out over these things the slightest little thing but pre-planning those types of things um collaborative feeding programs Again, you're not doing the food. Um, I, I, I work with the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. Um, there, there are so many avenues of food that are out there, and there are hungry people in your community. And here, here's where I'll go contrary to If you build it, they won't come. Hear me good. If, you, if people know, but there are organizations out there, you have food pantries in your community, you don't have to buy the food. But guess what you got? You have a facility that everybody in your community knows where it is. Collaborative feeding programs, community gardens, to where, again, you're not going to plant the garden. Maybe you don't know how to do gardening, but there are technical schools that are out there that need a place where students can practice their craft, and there are other people in the community that will want to join into you, to where people can now come and get fresh food. And there is something about fresh food and not having to get something that's stale and old or need, not even having access to those, those live foods. Uh, financial literacy classes, um, having, having regular community meetings. Every church I've passed it, I have regular quarterly meetings with the mayor and the chief of police and the sheriff. Wow. Bring the whole community in and let's talk about things. Let's talk about what you're planning uh, as far as police officers, sheriffs, Areas where you're having trouble and you say, I need your help in these communities because they're our communities. And you build this collaboration to where there's not this friction between law enforcement. Because I'm here to tell you, when you're in trouble, that wheel, wheel, wheel is the most beautiful sound you ever heard in your life. I thank God for the police. I want the police to be there and I want there to be a healthy relationship. But having those kind of community meetings, having a meeting where you call in the superintendent. Once a quarter, once every six months, whatever the case may be, but these community meetings, these are ways we can reconnect with our communities. Uh, I got five minutes left. Um, <laughs> Dougie Fresh had six minutes, but I got five. So I, I'll hasten on. Um, technology integration. There is so much money out there right now for technology integration. And it's no longer just the simple computer lab, but guess what? Your place could be a place of re-education. Again, you're not paying for the computer. You're not the subject matter expert that has to teach people how to use a computer. You're going to teach somebody how to use DOS. Nobody uses DOS anymore. You need somebody that knows what they're talking about. And again, you have subject matter experts in the community uh, who are looking to have an avenue and a place where they can come in and teach. You have so many nonprofits that are out there trying to educate and re-educate people, but they need a central place where they can draw people. Uh, starting your own CDC, your own community development corporation, funding that is out there. There are so many things uh, that you can do. I'm going to hasten on to my last slide and just deal with resurgence through introspection. And I call this Joseph's instrument. Y'all remember Joseph in the Old Testament sold into slavery, you know, favorite son, coat of many colors, and so forth. Joseph was a bruised, broken man. He had family issues, right? Um, and Joseph, remember, famine hit, and Joseph knew what to do, and everybody's need had need had to come to they had to come to Joseph. So we have the world kind of coming to Joseph, the world coming to Egypt. How do you want to picture that? And Joseph's ministry model is: I'm going to save up because I know the need is there. I'm going to run a decent, organized process, and regardless who you are, I'm going to make sure that your needs are met. I'm not going to look at where you're from. I'm not going to look at who you are. I'm not going to look at who your people are. But it's a fresh approach to ministry. But Joseph also understood this. I'm broken. And the people I serve are broken. And if I can say this to you respectfully, if you can't see your reflection in the people you're serving, you need to stop serving. Joseph was broken. He knew it was broken. Remember when his brothers came and his brokenness kind of broke out of him? Yeah. That all of us are broken in one way or another, but he saw that in it. So here are some things that we need to do to begin to strengthen internally within our African American churches. We got to do some intentional collegial leadership restructuring. It's got to be done on purpose. It can no longer be we believe in women in ministry and not be given opportunities for being leadership and being paid leadership roles. 
and be in senior leadership roles. That may not be a big issue here, but it's a big issue in North Carolina. Uh, doing us those things to where, again, we're looking at who's most qualified, and we're looking at the demographics of our church, and we're saying to ourselves, does our leadership look like the people we lead? Mm -hmm. And if it does, then you need to make some, some intentional changing and some restructuring um, to know that our churches, because we're in a different era, you know, we need to kind of change our governance a little bit. Um, it, it can't just be the pastor and two people making a decision. <laughs> you have educated people in your congregation. You have millennials who are looking to work and serve. And there's another research study that Pew did that, that shows the fact that uh, African-American millennials are still spiritual. They still love God. They just don't want to put up with some of the, and I'm going to use this word, shenanigans yeah. that happen in the church. So we have to do some intentional things for a more collegial leadership structure and make sure the church do that I've ever led. Your program should have an element for the community. If it's just for you and about you, then it's really not Christ-centric, it's not community-centric, it's really kind of become a club. But it's got to be a community-centric approach and it's got to have equitable inclusion. That whether you're male or you're female, whether you identify in a different um, gender than when you were born, it's got to be equity. And knowing that God is working through and working on all of us, and, and I don't think that, that what you don't like about me is any, any better or worse than what I don't like about you. But here's, here's my closing fact. I am flawed. And the way I can prove to you that I'm flawed is because I wear glasses. I have astigmatism. I'm flawed. And so far be it for me to say that my astigmatism is any better or worse than whatever God is working in and working through you. But what I do know is you have a value inside of you. You have a piece of God inside of you. And that's the part that I want to connect with. And we got to have equitable inclusion for everybody. There's a place for everybody to serve. And we'll let God do what God does. So paint the picture of what the black church is facing. Uh, showed you both some, some things that are without, some things that are within. Showed you some ways we can kind of begin to reconnect with our communities and begin to do ministry uh, the way Jesus outlined it there in Luke chapter 4. Uh, Carol Burnett said, I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> uh, and directly read, and he is going to now lead us through uh, question and answers. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Barr. I appreciate you. Can we clap? So if you all have any questions, I'm gonna pass the mic around. It'll catch up, it'll catch the audio for people who are online also. Um, so he won't have to repeat the question, right? No. Correct. All right, so any questions people have in the presentation? Yes. Follow a lot of those criteria, but folk aren't A and B, C and E. There are a lot of my granddaddy was United Methodist. So I wonder if we can expand that vision and not just have those. I know that that was his work, maybe you were forty, yeah. but uh, I feel like um, there are folks like in the Presbyterian Church who marched with Martin Luther King, who made sure that things occurred, and there are a lot of programs that I benefited from and directed later because of the work that those ancestors did. I just want to bring them into the issue. What's your name? Rochelle Hunter. Rochelle Hunter. Thank you for bringing that forth. Um, and certainly, we know when we talk about the black church today, it is more encompassing than just those that were named to the work done by Brother Lincoln. And I'm in complete agreement with you, and, and I hope, and let me say it this way, that the black is an African American or black work, but it is and should be inclusive of all. So thank you for bringing that. Others? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Barr. This is great. In the work that you've been doing with building up, though, and being able to identify certainly the challenges and then thinking through potential solutions, you gave a nice list there at the end, I think, of 10. I think it got you guys in. Do you have any success stories you can talk about in particular? And can you identify any of the reasons that they were able to take off and be able to take some of this guidance and say, yep, that worked? But what was it underneath it that kept it going? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, uh, one, one church just, just uh, in the last year that I'll speak to is a church in Thomasville. It was a church that was um, a very progressive church. 
and their pastor was living in a different way. They were going to strip all of that away. They were going to go back to their old Sunday school classes and kind of go back to the ways that they were doing things. And so I was able to sit down with the leadership and we talked about the success of the ministry and what they saw as the trajectory going forward. So what we did is we kind of created some surveys from the church and we asked them to a couple of strategic questions. Please identify what you say is a, or how you deem to be a successful church. What does a successful church do? So we came back and we shared the results of the survey with the congregation and began to get buy-in and groundswell of this is what a successful church looks like. Here are some of the things a successful church uh, does. Here are some things that we think a successful church should be doing that we don't see out there. And we again took that list and we began, began to rebuild that organization not just from the progressive point that they already were, but we were able to lay out a plan to kind of go forward. But we did that by helping them to kind of reimagine themselves. And one thing that I, I can say that we did in that too, is we kind of had to dig back into how do you see yourself as a church in the community where you serve now? And we had them look at some of the things they had done in the past, historically. We limited it to 50 years old, because this church is 100 and I think it was 104 years old. Last 50 years, what are some things that you really did well? What would it look like to do something similar to that in our new context? And so we used the benefit of history to kind of reimagine how we can do something similar in our present context. And so that church not only agreed to, I won't say stay on the path that they're on, but they, they re-identified who they were why they're there, and then we're able to put them on a path now to where they have just selected a pastor in the last eight months who is now leading them forward and they understand who they are now, not just who they were. And I think like most of us, you go back to what you know, and that's where they were headed. But that, that's one success story. Yeah. Another success story I'll share, I made mention of the church who uh, just laid the rest last year, their 94-year-old pastor. Prior to me coming on board with them, what they had done in the past was um, they would get somebody to come in and see how well they preached. And then that's who they would decide, that's the guy we want. And not really kind of look at um, what does our church need? What does pastoral care look like? What is their view of scripture? What is their view of family? What is their view of engagement with the community? And we were able to kind of say, what do you think your church needs? And that church is in the midst of their search process right now. But prior to then, they, they didn't have any kind of a search process, didn't have any kind of rubric to judge by. It was just kind of like, I like the way he preaches. Yeah. OK, I understand how it sounded. But, but literally, in the questionnaire they have to fill out from candidates coming in now, what was their subject? What was the passage of scripture? Uh, was it theologically sound? What were your takeaways? And it's making them be engaged in the process. And that's another one right now that I think is on the path to success that would have kind of gone right back to where they were. Uh, one last one on uh, community uh, engagement through, through food. Um, have a church in a, in a little town called Weddington um, that has just started a weekly food distribution um, to where they have partnered with the food bank. They're not in the territory that I cover. They partnered with the food bank to where now they're able to offer food. Um, they started out, their goal was to feed 100 people a week. Uh, and now they're already, uh, they were running out of food. They were running out of food. They had to increase, uh, increase the amount of food that they now receive from the food bank. And so that's one way that they're reconnecting with their community. Now, I can't say that they've seen any residual impact of growth, but they are re-engaging with this year. That's a success. Yeah. 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 Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Uh, we're going to turn to you in a second, Alex. We're going to do one online and then you. So you have a question online from Dr. Darvin Adams. The question is, what is your theological take on the black institutional church's role in helping to alleviate or eliminate poverty in black inner city neighborhoods. 
Yeah, yeah. So I don't think you can, um, and, and thank you, thank you for that question. I don't think you can disengage the gospel from community. I think there is an inherent um, both passion and demand that we seek to not only do justly, but to make sure that people's needs are being met and our engagement with people who are experiencing poverty to not just simply feel sorry for them. I think of the passage of scripture where it says that Jesus looked on the crowd and he had compassion upon them because they were sheep that basically were lacking a shepherd. They didn't have direction. And so I, I would say theologically, there is an absolute requirement for us to care about those who are disenfranchised, those who don't have the means or maybe even the opportunities to be able to see a different path forward and for our going out. And, and again, connecting back with that Luke 4, you know, going out to those places. It mentions the poor in Luke chapter 4. And we, we know we kind of argue, does that mean poor in spirit or poor in pocket? But certainly that our place to engage with those, to advocate for those, and to not just simply take the food out, but to see what we can do to help those people learn to fish. Are there some, is it an educational issue? Is it access to jobs? You know, what is the underlying issue that's maybe leading to some of that poverty? But I think we have an absolute mandate, a scriptural mandate, that we engage with those people and not just give them fish for a day, but help to kind of give them a leg up and a leg out to help them be able to stand on their own two feet. But theologically, I think it is clear um, I, I would even argue when we think about our theological perspective, not only being a New Testament practice, but even the Old Testament practice. Uh, we think about the law of the gleaners. Remember that? We can see that over the book. It is a God thing. And we absolutely, I, I would stand here and emphatically say there is a scriptural mandate that God would require us to care for the poor. Absolutely. Hi, Dr. Barg. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a student here at LVTS. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. I really uh, found your you could speak to the role of worship uh, in facing these uh, these issues. So, what are the strengths of um, worship in the Black Church, and what are the opportunities that you think um, that worship could play a role in facing these issues? So, so, so when I'm when I'm thinking of worship, I, I'm definitely thinking of more than just the singing and the atmosphere. So when I'm thinking of worship, I'm thinking about the overall impact of your life when you come into a service. I think this is another place of low hanging fruit, um, and it's a place too where I think if the church turns its attention from itself to the people who are coming in worship will change and it will be more impactful. So let me give you an example of that. So many churches in the midst or somewhere in their worship experience, they'll turn and they'll say, if we have any guests or visitors, will you please stand and tell us who you are? Okay, we have a very anxiety written, written group of people now. I don't want you to call me out. I don't want to stand out. And God knows I don't have anything to say because I don't sound like you. Yeah. And so we need to kind of change how worship happens. And instead of it being worship that's comfortable to us, that is worship that's comfortable to our guests. I don't like the term visitor because it, it sounds very unengaged and accidental. I like guests because guests show up. And, and Old Testament culture and New Testament culture to teach you to embrace those gifts. You may entertain angels unaware. So that's a place where I think worship could be a major part. So let's say someone visits something that we do. They came to uh, some type of a, we have a substance abuse program, a feeding program. They were touched by something there. I'm going to try them out. So our worship is the place to where we take them from first base to second base. I don't ask you to commit. I don't ask you to belong. But one thing you're going to get when you get here, you're going to feel loved. You're going to feel valued. And you're going to, as best we can, you're going to feel the presence of God. So I, I think if we really change our focus to what, what does it feel like to come here as a guest and we gear our worship towards that, 
and have preaching that is thought out and planned. I, I like to plan my sermons, so not only do I ser do sermon series, but I sit down with my deacons, I sit down with my ministers, I have focus groups, and I say, what do you think about this? What, do you, what, what are ways we can communicate this and, and, and really broaden your preaching? I think there's so much good theology in real life that people live out. And so that, that's what I'm really mean by this worship experience is the overall experience, not just the singing. Now, I got to say that, Alex, because in the African American church, there's a big emphasis on singing and on the, um, I don't know a better word to use, but the fun, I don't want to say entertainment because I think that's too demeaning, but um, the that, art, the art of preaching. The heart of the no, art. Not, art. I'm not talking about the art of preaching. I, I'm talking about we come in and we jump and we, yeah, the spectacle. We can yeah. use term yeah. that very that correct. Um, mm -hmm. We we want to have fun. We want to have a good time at church, and we can have a good time and not have anything that's impacted our life. So when I'm talking about worship, I'm talking about more than just singing and having fun. And speaking to the art of preaching, especially in the African American tradition, there is again a rhythm sometimes to preaching. Um, and and our still being able to appreciate our heritage and and express our blackness, but making sure that we have relevant preaching that doesn't just say uh, won't he do it, didn't he do it? Um, please don't be offended by this. He he say he was there for Shadrach, Meshach. This is a very bad colloquialism. He was there for Shadrach, Meshach, and the bad Negro. I mean, it's, I mean, terrible things that are said in the worship experience. But we gotta have relevant preaching that makes the worship experience impactful. But it's gonna happen, it's gonna be a paradigm shift. But I think worship is a place that we can have a major, major influence. I don't want you to belong, I want you to be here. One thing I didn't get to talk about is gig membership. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by gig membership in that term is, the day of having people for Sundays is gone. Yeah. But if you're gifted and you wanna serve, and you'll give me one Sunday a month, whether you're a member or not. Now this is this is this is going to be tough for some churches. I don't care if you're not a member. If you if you love the Lord, you have a gift, and you want to serve. Let's use you. Yeah. And having this thing of gang membership to where hey, you don't belong to this church, and you don't owe me anything. But if you want to come here and serve, we're going to use your gift because we need servant leaders. Yeah. And so worship, I think, is a great great place for us to really have a strong impact. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Uh, Teresa, I see you. We got one online, and then I'll come over here. Um, this one is from Lee Young, who is also an alumni. And the question has to do with uh, education. Yeah. So there's two parts to it, and they're related, but they're not exactly the same. Okay. What do you recommend for bringing back biblical literacy mm -hmm. in the church? And number two, um, as an educator, he wants to know, uh, um, actually, I don't know if this is he or she. She wants to know uh, about the effective, how effective is it to have your church interact with schools, to the superintendent, superintendent and local schools? Yeah, yeah. So bringing back biblical literacy. Um, so I'm, I'm serving at a church right now. And every Sunday, I say this, um, please bring your physical Bible to church. Discipleship is not about convenience, it's about sacrifice. And so trying to get people back to the place where you're bringing a physical Bible. I use the illustration that our phones and our iPads are used for a lot of things. So it's kind of like you have a multi-symptom cough medicine but, or, or medicine. And I've got a cough. I can take something that solves several things, or I can get something strategic. These devices are used for a whole lot of stuff. Bring your Bible. That's all it does. It specializes in being the Bible and trying to get people back to their place where they're reading the Bible. When it comes to biblical literacy, where we need now in an information age that we're in, I'm, that makes the scripture the scripture. And I think we, we build that biblical literacy from the pulpit and teaching the word of God. Again, I'm not taking away from anybody's tradition, but what I think what we need now in the information age we're in, we gotta get back to teaching, which means we gotta read scripture and we can't just simply say what the Bible says, but we gotta tell people, okay, so turn here now and we're gonna come back to this passage of scripture of what we do from the pulpit 
and not only there, but making sure everything you do throughout the ministry, whatever you call your teaching ministry, whether it's Bible study, whether it's Sunday school, you know, they need a curriculum, a curriculum that gets refreshed regularly. So I recommend whether you teach Sunday school or Bible study, you know, connect to these small six week, eight week studies. Yeah. And, and you'll be amazed that people who don't want the routine of Bible study, but people who are wanting information, things that's gonna help me live better, teach me about prayer, and you have these short studies that allow different groups to come in and connect with whatever your teacher might be. So I know that's a very simplistic response to the question of building biblical literacy. As it relates to connecting with community and connecting with your superintendents and your principals, um, I think it's in our best interest to build a stronger relationship with our schools uh, whether you're doing a mentorship program at a local school or whether you're working on the school level, I'm sorry, on the, um, what do you call it, the school district level, that you're doing some work collaboratively with that office to see where you're needed and building that rapport where it's not an awkward conversation to where if something happens to a student and there's a big outcry in the community that you need to be able to reach out and call doctors and lawyers. But if they can't read and do math, they're not going to be any of them. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure we've got a deep, strong relationship and our, our schools need our help desperately and being able to be there, to be aides to the teachers, to go on field trips, our presence makes the difference. We see in Job's life, just the, the, the ministry of presence really means a whole lot more than what you're saying a lot of the time. So our collaboration with our local community schools and even on a district level, building those relationships. And it's a lot easier to make than you might think. You might have to make a few calls, maybe a little bribery, take them out to breakfast or to lunch. But what matters is you get in front of them and you start to build a relationship. But I think it's incumbent upon us to build deeper relationships with our local schools and then our school community at large. This will be the last question. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, good evening. Teresa Smith, um, VP of Finance and Administration here at the seminary. Mm -hmm. I've gone to churches to do pre um, conversations, and there's the how this happened is, is important. I've gone to different churches for that. Um, I've had churches host funerals mm -hmm. to say, Our doors are open, doesn't matter who the person is that is deceased or that their family is unchurched, we're willing to have them in because it is a ministry. Mm -hmm. um, the food pantries of giving food during summer months or on a frequent basis, but then what that leads to in the lack of volunteers or discipleship fatigue when there are not enough folks to serve and to, to do. My question really becomes the balance between the do and the financial. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the churches that ask me to come out to do a pre need mm -hmm. assessment because they have finances to be able to hold their churches open um you know pay an additional electric bill for that so for some of the other churches that we are trying to get into you know we're, you know we're gonna have to charge to have a family come in to do a funeral because we don't have the finances to do that so in all of these activities that you mentioned how do you help churches bridge the gap in how do you go how do you help finance some of these activities that yeah, yeah. You, you still you still do that collaboratively we got to encourage our churches, and I know this is hard because we live in our silos, but for us to talk about what our common community needs are, and First Baptist Church getting with um, the Presbyterian Church and getting with the local CME Church and saying, hey, we want to have a pre-burial needs workshop. Do you have some people in your congregation that would be interested? And using those relationships that we have, um, when we think about um, doing an inventory assessment of what type of resources we have that would be considered an indirect resource. So let's say I have a small congregation and I don't have a lot of room for people to come in, but I want to do something like this, but um, the Methodist Church has plenty of space. Well, I call Pastor Shirley, Pastor Shirley, I want to have this event for the community. You know, can we host it there? Would you want to be a part of something like this? And so the church doing something that is gotten to be more the exception instead of a rule, becoming a rule again, to where we work together, to where, again, a smaller church may not have the capacity to do that, but they can say, this is a need, they can talk to other churches in the community that have that similar need, and host those types of things together. You hit on a major thing 
Um, we experienced explosive growth at this church I pastored in Waynesboro because we were the church that if you need a place to have a funeral, you can have it at our church. I love preaching funerals. I love it. I know that sounds morbid, but that's one moment in time. I know I've got your undivided attention. And all I need is to use Aunt Sally's life to introduce you to my Jesus. That's, that's all I want to do. I want to talk, I want to say everything the family told about how sweet she is yeah. and how she used to beat them when they took biscuits. I want to use all of that and use that context yeah. to tell you about what Jesus did by God. And, the same way, and, and use it. So that is a rich, rich opportunity to yeah. open up your doors to be the church that not everybody will do that. Not everybody have the capacity to run the air in the summertime. Now we're not gonna feed you, but we'll open up the doors, we'll have a service, we'll make sure you feel dignified, and we make sure you come in and you come out. But there are so many opportunities. But again, partnering with other local churches. And it really kind of becoming about let's serve our community and less about this is what our church did. Now, it's going to be uncomfortable because instinctively we want to get credit and say our church is doing, but I think there's really only one church that Jesus died for. Yes. A lot of different branches, but just one central yep. church. And having those conversations and really serving our communities. Yeah. I'll say this lastly about feeding programs and resources and volunteers. So one place the church used to be rich in is rich in volunteers. And... Uh, COVID took a stretched resource and finished it off. Yeah. Um, but you will be amazed, schools and other organizations that have mandatory volunteer time. Yeah. So why not partner with people that need a partner, that need work to do, and they don't have people that can do it. One of my Uber driver one day uh, was driving me, and I don't know how we drifted off into this, but she said she needed some community service hours for a, a school program she was a part of. We're getting ready to have our annual event. We're going to have about 5,000 people coming to town. You like people? Can I get you to welcome and greet people? And so, so, I mean, there's all these opportunities out there for us to connect with people and to grab people who need a place to serve. And oh, by the way, we have this weekly program. We can use your volunteers here. Yeah. It's so different, but partnership and yeah, reconnecting yeah. with our community, that's the way out. That's our path forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bob. And thank uh, you all online. Thank you all for being here in person. Um, before I let you go, I want to uh, let you know a little bit about what's still coming up and the fact that there are light refreshments outside provided by the Office of Philanthropy, Philanthropy and Stewardship. Um, so enjoy those. Um, go your way home, get some food, and log on to see the um, next portion of the Black Church Studies consultation, where we will have Dr. Session um, again presenting um, a short video followed by Dr. Merriweather, Dr. Moore, Dr. Caldwell Gross, and Dr. Flake. And in each case, they're coming with different perspectives on what the future of the Black Church can look like. Uh, they have their own lenses. We heard some in the sermon from uh, Dr. Session about where she's coming from. We're going to hear more in this video. And it's very different from what you'll get from Dr. Merriweather um, and where he's drawing uh, knowledge from. From Dr. Caldwell Gross, where he's pointing us to technology, which Dr. Barr mentioned a little bit, but that's the focus of his. And so we'll see from different people what they think about the future of the black church. And that gives us a taste of tomorrow's portion where um, they will be in conversation with each other. They're not just gonna have their little monologue. I'm gonna ask questions to put them in dialogue with each other. And that's at seven. Uh, so this is at seven tonight. And there's a link that you would have received for this. And then for tomorrow, it's at seven. And it's in person and online. So either one, I hope you're here in person. But if not, uh, I hope you'll join us online. Coming up on Tuesday, 27th of Tuesday, yes. uh, is the first of a three-part um, talk from the Grawmeyer winner, um, Dr. Alton, and his book, The Human-Shaped God. So he'll be um, leading us through a talk uh, about um, the provocative ideas that come up in that book. And then um, March 1st, correct? Yes. 
March 1st, we have the African American Reading. Always a great event, and our own Louisville, um, not featured special guests as well. <laughs> so please uh, join us for the African American Reading. Um, same person who did the, who was doing the uh, talk about his book, uh, uh, the um, study about his book that we can join, is having the big Rahmeyer lecture um, about the book here in our chapel on the 9th of April. And then finally, one more month, uh, we get to May, save the day, be ready for uh, baccalaureate on the 17th and commencement on the 18th. That's a Friday and Saturday. It's Friday and Saturday. It's a Friday and Saturday. Oh, and skip a few more months. <laughs> We've got uh, um, our president being inaugurated. It's a special service. Um, it's, it's not his first time being here, as you can see. <laughs> time when we get to all celebrate and we put all this together uh, for um, September 5th, 2024. All right. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>